I remember training for Mr. America. I was lying in my bed every night and my stomach was touching my backbone. That's how hungry I was. I remember that. I was starving, but I didn't quit. So I got condition wise, I got in the best condition humanly possible, but I didn't have any steroids in me. So I won the contest. Welcome to this week's Escape Your Limits podcast. My guest today is a legendary bodybuilder known as the Michael Jackson of bodybuilding. He's a nine times world bodybuilding champion who donned the cover of Muscle Mags throughout the 80s and has recently returned to the sport to take the Mr. Universe title at age 63 years old. Although the odds were stacked against him from an early age, he overcame impossible challenges to achieve success. In this interview, we discuss what it was like having Arnold Schwarzenegger as his mentor, how to build the perfect physique, common mistakes people make in the gym, and the importance of the mind and muscle connection. My guest's incredible story stresses one of the most important life lessons of all, and that's to never, ever give up. So please welcome bodybuilding legend, Mr. Tony Pearson, to this week's Escape Your Limits podcast. So Tony Pearson, thank you for joining us in the Virgin Hotel in warm Las Vegas. Thank you. It's November, and I'm surprised the weather's good. Thank yeah, God. Yeah, it's like the middle of summer. Right. No, it is. Today, yes. I'll wait until about Thanksgiving. <laughs> right. It gets it down to 40 and the wind chill factor on top of that. So how long have you been in Vegas? I moved here 2001 and I uh, just got tired of LA and Sean Ray lived here and he says, hey man, right. you should go over. Vegas is, you know, it's booming and get, get, so I bought a condo over here and, and, I, and I've been, I love it. It's great. Right. Great place. Great gyms. Yeah. When I moved here, they had six gold gyms here in town. So yeah, I was one of the first bodybuilders though. I go to the gym to work out at Ghost Gym. The guy says to me, this is more of a family gym. Right. We don't really want bodybuilders. I go, you got the name bodybuilder Ghost Gym on the outside, you know? <laughs> so he kind of warmed up to me a little bit later, but so it was fun, yeah. There's quite a few bodybuilders out here. Like Jay, is, is, what, has he got his own gym here? Jay uh, Cutler, I don't think he has his own gym. Right. But the, there's the Dragon Lear. Okay. Dragon Lear, that's where all the big pros are training now. And then that's uh, Mr. Olympia that owns it, and Iris Kyle is here, Hide, name it, the list. All the guys are here. Why do you think so, Vegas, of, uh, I know it used to be kind of LA, California. Why, why yeah, do you think LA that? was the mecca for and Gold's Gym, but over here it's like, um, there's a lot of competitions, shows every other, every other week, oh, amateur right. shows. The weather and then the cost of living is a little bit less than LA, mm -hmm. but it's raising, rising over here as well. But, uh, and, and, and the sun, we have sun almost every day. It's, when, we get, when it's overcast, you're like, oh my God, it's overcast, this is a shocking. Yeah. Or if it rains, like, oh my God, it's raining for a couple of days. So we, we get this uh, all year long, all right. so it's good. So it's great to meet you. I was, I, I was saying when we was walking over from the coffee shop, I, I used to, in the mid 80s, I'd, I'd get all the muscle magazines back in England. And mm -hmm. I always remember you, because you kind of had this Michael Jackson sort of hairdo. And, um, and, and the, the sort of look, I guess, was, I know they call you sort of, didn't they call you sort of something to do with Michael Jackson? The Michael Jackson of bodybuilding. Right, okay. And that came about from an article with Ricky Wayne, who was the editor-in-chief of Muscle and Fitness in 1984. I went to the office doing an interview with him, you know, about working out. He kept looking at me and staring at me, and I'm like, why is he staring at me, you know? And then he goes, um, you know, Michael had his nose John nose done and I said yeah and he goes I know you had your nose done and I said yeah but, and, and he goes you look like Michael Jackson and I, and I go really he goes yeah and he says I'm gonna put that in the article we're just gonna write that so that's how it started from that day and you had a I, I think I seem to remember and, and this is going back a long time but you kind of had you did the sort of jacket thing as well did you I did the jacket right I had the, the ponytail <laughs> I had, had the hat. Yeah, I did the whole thing, went all out. Yeah. I mean, if you're gonna be Michael Jackson, you gotta look the part. Right. So, it's, you know, it's just for entertainment. Yeah. People wanna see a show. Right. I mean, your basic poses, but I was transitioning well. I had some great teachers that teach me how to pose. And I picked up some of Michael's moves, the little dance moves. And uh, it kept me busy. I think many people, I used to do the shows in places, like for those who are listening from England, in places like Skegness and uh, which are kind of, you, you probably wouldn't have heard of places like that, but it, it, it kind of created a lot of 
people that imitated or imitated but took your style and 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 developed it as well so I think you were, you were certainly kind of an innovator, I guess, in, in that and also with the, were you one of the people that kind of helped introduce the mixed pairs as well into yes. competitions? Yes, that started in 1980 and Chris Dickerson and Lynn Cartwright, I think, they won the first two. So I was in the airport flying somewhere and Wayne D'Amelio called me and I, I, I called him back and he goes, um, there's a mixed pairs show coming up. I want you to put you in it, and uh, I want you to pose with Shelley Gruel. I go, what? Mixed pairs? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. If, I said, okay. So I fly to L.A., and I went to go to uh, Fresno, California, where she lived, and the guy who put together the routine name is John Brown. No one knows that. Right. He won Miss Universe in London a couple of times. Okay. He, yeah, and uh, he was a great poser, great dancer, pop locker. He put together a routine for us. She's an ex-gymnast, so that helped a lot, too. She knew, the, she knew the lines, the flexibility, and all these transitions. And then I got the hang of it. I said, okay, this is how that works. So we won the first two years. And then it went on to 1988. So I won six out of seven. Lost one. But then the following year, we won two years, and the following year I posed with Carla Dunlap, who's a synchronized swimmer. So she knew about the art, too. Mm -hmm. And we just kind of put the routine together. You got to find someone that's compatible to your height, your frame, your structure. And when you pose, you have to pose as one. I watch amateur posing; they're too far apart. So you got to look at this part and look at this part. Mm -hmm. It's all as one. When you transition, is was a lot of rehearsal because if you make one mistake, everybody in the house saw it. <laughs> if you're posing alone, you make a mistake. You go, oh, forgot the pose. Just keep moving. Yeah. You know what I mean? Just keep moving. But in the couples, it's a lot of work, and I wish they would bring it back because we have social media now. There's so many incredible bodies out there, girls and guys that could team up and come up with routines. Right. Be creative. This is where the artistic side comes out. Yeah. You know. I was, I was reading where you said you were one of one of your earlier um, events where you kind of had this guy with the sax and you had these lights and you said uh, no. You, you, it was kind of the first <laughs> idea and nobody said anything and you were like. Oh, shit. <laughs> yeah. There's a big story behind that. Ken Spriggs, do you know who that is? No. He owned Gold's Gym from 19... So he, he bought the gym from Joe Gold's, the original owner. So from 1972 to 1979, he was the owner. And I won the America 78. So he came to me. I won, I won the LA 78 as well. Back in those days, you win Mr. LA, you're going somewhere because the competition was fierce. So he came to me one day and he goes, I want you to pose with doing a mixed payers competitions. And I go, what is that? You know, because women were not on stage in those days. Right. It, was, it was a guy world. But this girl at the gym, her name is Lisa Lyon. She's a legend. And uh, she says, I want you to pose with Lisa Lyon. I go, oh no, straight out. I'm not gonna pose with her. There's impossible. A girl and guy on stage flexing muscles? No way. He convinced me to do it. I said, okay, I'll do it. She's an artist, thank God. And um, she said, let's get a guy to blow the saxophone live. Okay. We won't have stage light. We'll have two spotlights. Okay. And we spent hours and hours creating this routine. And I was kind of following her lead pretty much. And um, yeah, so we get to the show and the announcer had a problem even introducing it. <coughs> Mixed Paris competition. <laughs> Because those days, these are hardcore fans. They want to see bodybuilding. They want to see muscle. It was the most exciting time in bodybuilding because you get standing ovations just from walking on stage. I mean, the, the roof is shaking. Seriously. In the mid-70s, it, it was just booming. And, but there was silence. At the MSC Auditorium downtown LA, you couldn't hear a pin drop. They were all sitting there going, you know. So I'm going through the routine with her. We're on point. We're doing everything just the way we rehearsed it. And I'm saying to myself, what have I done? <laughs> this is bad. <laughs> it's not, this is not good. But the moment we ended, they stood up cheering, applauding, stomping their feet, going crazy. So yeah, it's, it, was, it was shocking. And from that moment forward, women bodybuilding exploded. She won, she went on to win the first professional women bodybuilding championship. And then she kind of retired, went, went to France or something. But yeah, it, it just exploded. Then the next thing came out, Miss Olympia. It's a new category. 
So Lisa and I was the first one to, to be brave enough mm. with an L.A. crowd <laughs> to go up there. But Ken Sprague had a great idea. Yeah. He had a vision, and I didn't see it. So this is Lisa. She came to the gym, Ghost Gym, hardcore, real serious, got all the pros. All the pros from around the world came to Ghost Gym. That's what you had to be if you wanted to be in the magazine, if you wanted publicity. That's all you had was a magazine. Mm. There was no TV cameras. So they were all trained. I saw them every day. I'm in the middle of it. I was a kid, so I was in, I was in heaven, like going to a candy store. And uh, yeah, so that's, that's how it all began. Yeah, all, yeah. So like I said, Ken Spray had a great idea and it's amazing when you look back. Now I look back and go, wow. Well, you're an innovator, really, weren't you? You know, he had the idea, but you, you were obviously had that creativity with your partner to, to kind of, you know, take it. Yeah, I think he saw that, too, that I can actually move and be graceful and all this. Yeah, that's why he said, you guys can make a good match. He says, well, she's 5'3", you're 5'8". The balance is good. The symmetry is good between you two. And, and, and the contrast, black and white, mm. is going to be good. And, and the spotlight really worked. Because you know you don't see that today. Just two spotlights in the house, pitch dark, and so every time the light, you know what I mean? It's different. So yeah. yeah. So when I when we set up the interview, I was was really going to focus on the bodybuilding journey um, because that's something I knew about, and we've interviewed a bunch of bodybuilders. But I, um, I we found out about the book here, Driven, and and I've been reading in it, and um, don't don't take this wrong but it, I, the first part was almost like a horror story it was you know I and um, I had it, it and I sort of read it late at night and so I kind of had morphed into these strange dreams as well but there was you know as a kid you know being burned beaten starved enslaved mentally tortured you know it, it's it's hard to imagine how you're you're sitting here today with a huge smile on your face and and because life could have gone very differently, I guess. Absolutely, yes. So for 12 years, I thought I was going to die each day. So imagine the level of intensity in your nerves, thinking about today could be the day. Because I was threatened, told, you're going to, I'm going to kill you. So that's how for 12 years you live like that. You're in, you're in flight mentally. You're never in a calm state of mind at all, ever. And starving on top of it. I mean. I remember going to class and I would just sit in class and just stare in space, teachers teaching the kids. And I'm like, I didn't hear anything. When you're that hungry and you're that starving, you can't focus, you can't concentrate, you're a child. Yeah. I mean, you know what you're gonna get when you get home. So it's just a trauma. Yeah. And you have to walk to school for you miles. To, yes, you walk the miles. <laughs> and then uh, you read the picking cotton part. Right. Where she would take you out of, uh, took me out of school for three months at a time, and we catch a bus every day to the cotton fields, and we pick cotton for ten hour days. And picking cotton, like I've, I can't ima I, I can imagine what it is, but I can't. But like you would in the book, you were explaining like how it used to cut your hands and hurt your back. It was a, it was a brutal. It sounds like cotton's nice and soft and a fluffy thing, but it was a, a brutal thing to do. Is that right? Very brutal because uh, it has spurs. So we, we reached to pick the cotton. There are spurs around it to hold the cotton in, and that's what cuts your fingers. And you do it for 10 hours a day, so your hands are really all cut up and bleeding, back, bleeding. And then you're bending over the whole time. You can't pick cotton standing up, so you're leaning over. And you have a sack about 80 to 90 pounds on your back, so you got to pull that sack along to put the cotton in it. And then you have the heat, it's like 110 degrees, and the humidity is about 100 degrees on top of you the whole day. So were there other kids, or were you one of the only few kids that were doing that? Because I can't imagine like the people that were organizing that, knowing that there's little kids doing this kind of work. There was very few other kids that I saw. I remember that. There was very few kids out there. But at that time, no one cared. Really? No. We In America? No one cared. <laughs> this is the Deep South in the 60s in Mississippi. I mean, no one has time to be dealing with something like that. In my school teacher, eventually my principal came to the house and said, he hasn't been to school in three months. And that's, she pulled the shotgun. <laughs> I know. And scared him off. And that was the last that he came. Last, exactly. And she was serious. She was dead serious. Because I don't care about that either. So, you know, there's a lot of things happen down. Who cares? 
Thank you for supporting the Escape Your Limits podcast. If you're thinking about creating a unique and engaging fitness space to take your fitness to the next level, then we have you covered. Escape Fitness design and manufacture some of the most innovative, attractive, and durable functional training and free weight equipment used by many of the best trainers and fitness brands across the globe. As a valued listener, we are offering you a 10% discount off many of the products on our website. You can check out the full range by going to escapefitness.com and use the code DUMBELL. That's escapefitness.com using the code DUMBELL. That's it for me. Please enjoy the rest of this interview. How long did that, I know it's slightly off subject, but how long did, like it sounded like you were, you were a very young kid, like terrible things were going on and almost like in, in the view of other people kind of, you know, it weren't like you weren't going out, you were going to church, you were picking cotton, you were going to school, like surely people in the area must have kind of seen like this, 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 this is not right. A lot of people knew, but in the deep south and African American community, you, you, you keep it in the family, you keep it hush hush, no one talks. No one talks, no one tells, so no one's going to call the authorities. I knew the neighbors knew, they knew, no one said a word. It was just the code, it was just the way you were raised in those days. And I didn't say a word, I wouldn't dare tell someone, you're done. And the day I did tell my counselor, I'm getting upset now. It took a lot of courage to tell him. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 guess, I guess even for grown-ups, you know, like having, you know, even if you're in a relationship, it's difficult. Like as a, as a kid who's still forming their view on life, right. um, you know, they, they, pro- they don't even know whether that's right or wrong or normal, I guess. That's so, all you know. Yeah. You know what I mean? The school, you know, and you didn't tell your teachers, your playmates at school, you didn't tell them, and you thought they were probably getting the same treatment. You just, you don't know. I didn't have any friends. I wasn't, wasn't allowed to have friends. Because I think they would kind of expose her more. The more she kept you locked away, you know, no one knows anything. So no one knew. The only person knew was when I got to St. Louis, I was 13 maybe. So from age three until 13, I was essentially locked up. You know, keep your mouth shut. And I got people watching you you do anything wrong, they're going to tell me. You're going to get a beating again. You're not going to eat for a week. <laughs> You're going to sleep outside. So, yeah, it's... Uh... Well, this goes back to my dad. My dad gave me away. Well, the situation was he, he, he married my mom, and she was much, much younger than he was, and he locked her up in the house. He had all four or five kids, and, and then he threatened to kill her, and... You know, he beat her up many, many times. And, and then she realized he's going to kill me. She came at 27 years old. She realized this, it's going to happen. Just a matter of time. So in the middle of the night, she packs her put back and escapes. She leaves. So now he's sitting there with four or five kids. What am I going to do with these kids? And he was a really mean guy. He always had the gun in his pocket. His loud was, his voice was very intense. I have a picture of him that's in the book. Look into his eyes, tell me what you see. It's scary to even look at his picture. Just even now. So she ran for her life, you know, and uh, he had these kids and he thought of his, it was his mother's sister. And he just gave me away. And he never came back. So that's how I started living my great, my great auntie. So, yeah, it's... And uh, you were saying she was a formidable character, only really afraid of your father, and and outside of that, no one... no one. (laughs) She had the shotgun. (laughs) And you... Physically, she was... She was tough. I mean, you know, she's picked cotton, she... do the hay, she plowed the fields. I mean, she was born in 1903. I mean, she was, like, buffed. She had muscles. She was very intimidating. I mean, just her appearance. Imagine her standing over me, yelling at me, and I'm four years old, five years old, looking up. You know, you're gonna die. I'm gonna hang you in the tree, that's what she said. I'm gonna hang you in the tree outside. <laughs> did, did you ever sort of, I suppose, um, 
you know, like give up hope at all or, or become close to sort of like thinking, I, you know, I just can't do this anymore. Completely. At age 10, I was, I was wise enough to realize I'm trapped. There's no way out. You're not going to call the police. You wouldn't dare. Oh, <laughs> you're not going to tell anybody. And you're just living your own little world. You know, survival mode. I don't know, I had such a will to live. It's strange. Uh, when I was 10 years old, I remember I lived in a two room shack. And I was standing in the middle of the floor. And I'll tell you, the pictures on the wall was Martin Luther King, Robert Kennedy, and JFK. Those pictures she had on her wall. And I would see them every day. So I looked up at the pictures and I looked up at God and I said, why must I live like this? Out loud, at 10 years old. So I knew I was in hell. That was the gate of hell. And there was no way out. So, you know, suicide at the time wasn't, I never heard of such a word. Right. You know, I'm 10. I've been sheltered completely. And there was no publicity about that. So that, that's, that's not even a thought. But I was really in a survival mode. I just, I ran away a few times. I tried to escape and she knew everybody and everybody knew her. And when you see her coming, everybody starts shaking. So I go to my neighbor's house or my friend's house. So sometimes I walk like a half a mile to get to these places, trying to get away. And she'll come and just snatch you back. Let's go. Now you're going to get a beating when you get <laughs> So that one, about three or four times this happened. And then you just kind of give up. You surrender. You must have had, like, hope. Was there anything that you can remember, like, you talked about the pictures, but was there anything you can remember that sort of did kind of give you that hope, that sort of a little bit of a spark in, in terms of, okay, this is a new day, I'm going to keep, keep going? No, there was no hope until... Her daughter, she had a daughter. Her husband had passed away. She was in her mid-50s, pushing 60. Flora Child is super old. Mm -hmm. She's really old. She drank every day beer. And she had snuff, snuff, okay, tobacco the, thing. Right. Yeah, every day. Until her daughter said, hey, come to St. Louis and live with me. So we're going to move out of the old shack. We're going to pack up and go to St. Louis. And I got really excited going to the big city. You know, it's going to be a big, beautiful house. And, and she, she told me the, the law before we got there. I'm still in charge. I'll kick my own daughter's butt, that's what she said. So that was the only time I was like, some excitement. So I got to St. Louis. Uh, I went to junior high school, started high school, and I made some friends outside she didn't know about. Okay, not allowed to have any friends. So it got to the point where I was just sitting in class one day and just standing, staring out the window and not listening to the teacher. And the teacher recognized something is seriously wrong. So she sent me to the counselor's office and uh, I told him the story. And believe me, I was shaking inside because I told. Mm. So they, the, um, the state of Missouri came and took me out of the home with police escort. The police came in. It's the only way. Because she got the shotgun and always got a pistol in her pocket. <laughs> so yeah, they put me in a group home. They finally got me away from her. I was, what, 13? So all those years. It's quite old, isn't it? You know, like, well, gee, you know, 13 right. years old. Yeah, yeah, so. That's how it all went down. I don't want to tell the whole story. Yeah, no, I don't want to give it away as well. I, I, so, you know, like how, obviously, like unbelievably traumatic, you can't even picture, but how did, like, obviously you took that lesson and you used it in a way that would enhance your life and other people's lives. Um, uh, really when you, you know, I, I, like if you could just imagine someone like that, are like, okay, well, I'm going to get guns. I'm going to like, life doesn't matter, I, I, you, you could very easily have gone down a very different direction, not had money, not had a family, not had anyone that cared for you, but you didn't do that. What, what do you think kind of helped shape 
those critical decisions that you made in life from when you were, and we can go through some of those those points. But you know, what what do you? Was there anything now as you reflect back on why you chose the the good road in in some respect? I don't know. I honestly, like I said, I didn't have a plan. I this is what happened when I got to St. Louis. I think I believe in God. I'm from the Deep South Baptist Church. Oh, we went to church every Sunday, that's for sure. But I got a beating when I got home. <laughs> but I did go to church. So I do believe in God. There is, there's a higher, higher power, you know, that's looking over you. So I met the great champion. You know who that was? Mr. Muhammad Ali. Yes. That inspired me so much. Imagine when you're 13, 14 years old and you see the world champion. He was the current world champion at the time. And, you know, from where I've come from, and he's standing in front of me, and I'm looking up at this guy, like, oh, my God, he's like God. Had on his big, this three-piece suit, all the shoulders out to here, and his big shoulders. He was much bigger in person than he does as he look on television. And I go, oh, my God, I, I, I want to join a team, sports, do something. And I said, oh, well, I can't play football. I'm too slow. <laughs> I'm too short. I'm not fast enough. And then my friend said to me, you're really strong. And I got really strong from cutting down trees as a child, chopping wood, carrying buckets of water, picking cotton, pulling the sack. So I got really strong. I was a strong little kid. Mm. I was tiny. And I said, and he goes, why don't you go out for the wrestling team? I go, yeah, that's a good idea. And I made it. So I made the wrestling team. And second year in, I blew my knee out. I mean, you could hear it ripping like a piece of paper. So the doctor repaired the knee and... Um, he said, go to the weight room, this is 1974, go to the weight room and rehab your knee, lift some weights and try to bring the knee, leg back. I said, okay, never been to a weight room before. So every day I go to the weight room at school, I had a universal machine. Yeah. <laughs> and we were and I try to lift on you know, all the weights on every, every station, you know how the kids are. And there was other kids that were working out too. And after the three or four months and I rehabbed the knee and I started getting bigger genetically, I think I had a gift. And my wrestling coach came in one day and he goes, you put some muscle on. And I said, yeah, and I was getting stronger too. He says, well, you want to go to a real gym tomorrow? So this is how all this fell into place. I didn't plan it. I go, of course I'm going to go to a real bodybuilding gym. He goes, yes. Wow, okay. I'm, so I, I go there, what, I'm 19, 18, 19. It's called George Turner's Gym in St. Louis, Missouri. Now, George Turner had five world champions come out of his gym. He was an ex-Marine, he was tough, he was loud, and he was mean. <laughs> but that's what I, I was used to that though, see? Yeah. <laughs> I just fit right in. But I always knew, keep your mouth shut with George. I never said a word or said I can't or I won't or it's, you know, because I know what he's going to say. There is that effing door, you can take it. That was his attitude. I, ain't got, I don't have time. So I always did what George told me to do. And he's, I worked out that first day and I felt good. I did all the machines, I did all the exercises. And George came over to me and go, what the F are you doing? The whole gym can hear this. Get in my office. <laughs> <laughs> I'm training you. Be here tomorrow at six o'clock and don't be late. That's how it started. So for nine months, he beat me up every day. You know, I want you to do pull-ups, 10 sets of 10, Monday, Wednesday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturdays, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, we're going to do 10 sets of 10 on the squat rack. We're going to build those bird legs, he said, because I had no legs. It's funny you should say that. I think that stuck because I remember when I, I got beaten by a guy, a similar type of guy that you explained in my gym, and, it, and he was the same. It was 10 sets of 10, and I remember I couldn't, the first time I did it, I couldn't <laughs> walk for like a week. Right. He just destroyed me. Yes. <laughs> Yes, I couldn't. That get, must have just been like the secret, right? Ten sets of ten, and you, you're good. You know? You're good. You're gonna grow. <laughs> I couldn't get out of the car sometimes. <laughs> I mean, your legs are so sore. But after that warm-up set, okay, I'm good. You know, when yeah. you're young, you recover real fast. Yeah. And I was so excited. Oh man, that was like heaven for me. Weight training, after what I had gone through. Yeah. You know, I had a coach training me for free. You know, maybe he saw something in me that I didn't see. And I just did whatever George said to, and I listened really well. And then after nine months, I grew, and the legs, he brought the legs up. So people said, I don't have legs. Put this on camera. People said, Tony Pierce don't have legs. Arnold said I did. <laughs> when he discovered me on Muscle Beach, I was squatting 400 pounds in 100 degree weather on Venice Beach. 10 sets of 10. That's what I was doing, because that's what I was taught to do. 
but the weather was <laughs> brutal. So I had legs when I went on stage, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> I keep hearing that he didn't have legs. How did I win nine world titles with no legs? I'm, I must be Houdini. I'm, <laughs> I'm David Copperfield or something. Yeah. So I don't get it. So I was squatting and the legs grew. You know, Arnold discovered me. So getting, how, how did I get to California? I, you know, I just told George after nine months and uh, I'm gonna move to California because I've been hearing about all the music and all the, the champions live out there and they train at Gold's Gym and that's the place you gotta be. You know, I just, I just gotta get there. And there was something came over me that was urgent to get there now. I could feel it from the inside. You have to go and you have to go now. Timing, everything's about timing. Mm -hmm. So I got that one-way ticket on a bus. I sold my graduation clothes to get the money to get the one-way ticket. One way. One way. <laughs> and I, I told everybody, I'm not coming back. This is it. I'm, I'm not returning. I, was, I, I call it a live and die in L.A. Because you, you tried to get out to California in the Marines, didn't you? And, and I that, did. That. that was another angle of getting to California. Because it's a, in the river. No, no. It's a, down by San Diego. There's a, a yeah, mili big, big base, yeah. military base. Right. I said, well, if I can get to California down south, you know what I mean? I'm in California. And that was a big dream for you then, was it? That California? Uh, yes. Yeah, that was part of the dream. And, and, and I got rejected. The, uh, the drill sergeant, tall, voice, tough, strong, you know, Marine. He says, hey, kid, you want to be a Marine? I go, yeah, of course I do. I'm, you know, I'm ready. Do the duck walk across the room. I couldn't do the duck walk. I had water in my, because this, this car is still here. So I had a full career on a bum knee. How did I do it? I was still squatting. Yeah, I was in pain the whole time. It still hurts today. It still hurts. So I couldn't do the duck walk. And he goes, you can go home. You're done. And I was crying as I was walking out the door. I was so up to go into the Marines. And the, what is this? The, the few, the proud the Marines. And that was a commercial. And it's still running today. And I go, yeah, the few, the proud the Marines. I'm going to be a Marine. <laughs> he sends, sends me home. And it's, uh, I guess plan B was to become the bodybuilder, but only because I was introduced to that with my coach and then George. And then I said, George, I'm moving to California. And boy, did he flip out. He slammed the table. He jumped up. He had an intercom on his, uh, in, in his office. He was sitting in the office and he was watching everybody in the gym. You know, hit the button on the intercom and said, hey, you know, don't drop that weight. One more time, you're out of here. <laughs> Put a shirt on. No tank tops in this. <laughs> yeah, that was George. That's the kind of person he was. Yes. Yeah, so he's yelling at me. You're never gonna make it. This kid's 15, 15 years old. Got arms bigger than yours. You're never gonna make it out there. And I'm, my, I was like this, going. <laughs> I was stunned. I was like his protege after yeah. a while, you know. So he finally calmed down. He says, "Okay, if you're gonna go to L.A., go to Gold's Gym in Venice. I had never heard the word Venice, California before. I heard of that Los Angeles, yeah." Go to Venice, California, and, and look up uh, Ken Waller. He was in Pumping Iron, Ken Waller. Right. Tell him I sent you. Maybe he can help you. Because Ken trained his gen, uh, Samir Benu, Dave Johns, uh, Phil Williams, a good friend of mine. Phil Williams won Mr. America twice, you know. And that was all in, in um, the gym that you left in, in, in St. Louis. St. Louis, oh, right. right. Wow. George Turner's gym. So some big names. Yeah. They had all went to California. <laughs> And I kind of knew, you got to go to California. That's the place. And I seen, so I, I want to go to Muscle Beach. So when I got to LA and I, and I made my way, finally, you read the book, I'm not going to tell that part. Finally made my way to, Muscle, to, to Venice and I wanted to go to Gold's Gym first. So I walked into the original Gold's Gym. I think it was about six weeks before the Olympia because everyone was there. Joe Weider was there training Frank Zane, right. taking pictures. I remember Frank, he was really tan. And he had his belt on real tight, you know. I was like, oh my God, Frank Zane. You know, then you had Robbie Robinson over here trained like a beast with Manuel Perry. And oh, the list goes on. Ken Waller. So I saw Ken Waller, right? And, I, and, and George had told me to go talk to him, introduce myself. I said, oh, hell no. He weighed about 240. He was huge. He looked really mean. I said, I'm not going to go near that guy. I'm going to... I avoided it. No way. He's going to break you in half in one one. <laughs> so Ken Waller was there. And all these guys, I, I sat in the corner for about 30 minutes. And the manager said to me, hey, kid, get over here. You know, what are you doing? What, what, you know, what are you hanging around the gym for? 
I said, well, I, can, I, can I work out for the day? I don't have any money. He said, no, you got to leave. And he threw me out the gym. Really? I got thrown out of ghost gym. <laughs> so, yeah, and I went down to Muscle Beach. I went straight to Muscle Beach and same situation. It was wall to wall. Was it just because you were kind of an outsider and like? No, because I didn't have the money for the membership. Oh, you just did. Okay, you just wanted to. I said I don't have any money. Can I train for a day? No, and you can't be hanging around the gym. He goes. Right. So I sat there for thirty minutes watching the pros work out. It was the most amazing thing I have ever seen. For nineteen years old, just arrived. I don't know anyone in the whole state. Did you have much money with you? I had seventy-five dollars, but now I was down to about nine dollars. Because I wasted 10 days. <laughs> it's in the book. I want to tell you that part. Yeah. I wasted 10 days and I had about $9 left. And, and I watched these guys. And I mean, they were training so hard, so intense. I mean, the level of intensity that you couldn't imagine. But I was enjoying it. I was, I was with George. I've been doing the same thing. So, you know what I mean? But to watch them in person. And TV is one thing. But live? Oh, yeah. Then I knew I'm going to be a bodybuilder. Had you seen these guys like in magazines and some stuff before? Not right? so much, but more on TV. Oh, on TV. Because every year they would 73, 74, 75, they would show ABC Wild World of Sports. They had Mr. Olympia on. Oh, okay. And all the, all the champs were there and I saw them live posing. So, yeah. But, but even at that point, seeing it on television, I never thought I would be one. I just couldn't see myself, you know. But I wanted muscles, I know that. Of course, you're a kid, you want to show your arms. Yeah. And, uh, but that day from watching it live at that gym, I go, for sure, I'm going to be a bodybuilder. And I thought to myself at that moment, if I work hard enough, I have to look back at those guys. And that's I, an interesting thing you say there, because I, I made a note about that. A lot of things that you could have done could have been down to you. And obviously with bodybuilding, it is down to you, but, but it's also one of those sports where there's a lot of genetics involved. Yes. Um, a big part of it so like no matter how brilliant you were and determined which clearly you were there's there's a, an element that you just can't control it's not like i suppose trying to learn something in school right. you know you, there's only so far hard work can take you with exactly <laughs> exactly i look back now and go i was blessed with something and george turner saw that he saw this stupid kid over there training i trained for three hours <laughs> he got really pissed but he saw something in my structure, bone structure, and my attitude towards what I was doing. Even though I was training alone, didn't know what the hell I was doing, but I was trying to train as hard as I could. I think he saw that too. When Arnold discovered me, I think he saw that as well. What was that like? What was that meeting him? Shocking, stunning. How I old mean, was you? I was 19. I had just arrived. Within a, and that's why I said the urgency was for me to get there as soon as possible. I got there in June. He discovered me in October. It's a very short period of time. And I would go to the beach every day because I couldn't afford to go to the real gym, train on the beach. You know, every day and I walked that boardwalk, had a little tiny apartment right off the boardwalk. And, and he discovered me that day and I turned around. It was, it was wall to wall people watching us work out. You know, had the music playing, and you had Zeppelin, you had, you had um, oh my God, you name it, Rolling Stone. Rolling Stone they're playing and blasting the music. The energy was amazing. I'll tell you, body it was huge, just massive. People from all over the world, from, from Sweden, from Germany, from you know, they're all there because that's the only place to go to see the real bodybuilders in person. Mm -hmm. They're not on TV. So I'm crowded. I finished the workout, me and my partner. I'm talking to the people in front of me around the, outside the gate. And they all looking behind me like, like this and I'm like what's wrong with them <laughs> what's wrong with you guys <laughs> so I turn around and Arnold is standing in front of me so I'm looking up like <laughs> now I'm like <laughs> and he gave me you know what he said in the book I'm not going to try to say what he repeated yeah. and, he's, and he took me through the workout and I look back now I go why did he do my chest he trained my chest and my triceps why because I didn't have any and that's what he saw too mm. He says, I've been watching you for months. So my legs were there. He didn't say, let's go build your legs. Let's do chest and tricep, he said. Okay. And then do the whole workout. I didn't say two words. I'm just in awe. I'm watching, you know, I'm listening to him. I'm watching every move he's making, tricep extension, dips, bench. I remember what, all the exercises I remember. And I'm just like, 
you know, you're like frozen. <laughs> like, is this real? You know, pinch yourself. He was tan and he was in great shape. This is a year later after he's retired. He oh, was right. still huge. He was, he was really in phenomenal shape. And I'm like, okay. But then he writes down the number to go see Joe Weider. I had never heard of Joe Weider. He connected you with Joe Weider? Yes, he sent me. I never heard of Joe Weider. <laughs> you know, you know, I pick up a magazine at high school in a magazine, you just skim through, you don't look for Joe Weider's name, <laughs> the body of him. And he says, go to Joe Weider and tell him to put you in a magazine, tell him I sent you. So write an article. And I go, okay. <laughs> you know, overjoyed. So, and, and I remember him walking away from me. They always said Arnold didn't have legs. His legs were huge. He was walking like, you know, like a the bodybuilder walking. Like, oh my God, his legs are huge. That's, I, never, I could still see the picture. So after that, did you realize that that was probably quite a sort of a, almost like a bit of a changing moment? Because I guess, you know, this kid come from Missouri with nothing, no money, and then suddenly you kind of meet one of the greats at that time, or even today, I suppose, and they're like, there you go, there's a uh, right. attorney. Yes. <laughs> Call this guy. <laughs> I mean, he confirmed it for me that I could be, because he said I could be. Right. And I believe that. I mean, if any other pro had came to me and said, you, he said, you're going to be a great champion someday, you have the potential to be. And that just stuck in my head from that day forward. I said, if Arnold's believe it, it must be true. The best guy, on the, at the time, he was the best guy on the planet. Yeah. And that really inspired me, that motivated me, and I trained even harder. I raised the, raised the bar. I burnt out all my training partners. Oh yeah, it's, it's all out. It's a blitz every time you go to the gym. But I was enjoying it. You know, people go to the gym now, they're oh, I gotta go do back, to, I gotta do legs, to, you know. No, I can't wait to get there, you know? And we go twice a day. <laughs> These guys train once a day now, and they go home and sleep. No, we train at six o'clock in the morning, train at 5 in the afternoon, you do it six days a week, you can do it 20 years. That's what you do. I mean, you do the work. I keep writing on Instagram, social, you know, on social media, do the work. Stop talking about doing the work. Mm. And, you, and another thing is too, they're always opposing every five minutes between sets. You know, in my day, they throw you out of the gym if you did that. <laughs> <laughs> There's a door, take it, kid. <laughs> this ain't for you. <laughs> After I won the America, I'll tell you a quick story. I won the America and I go home to Venice, California and got back to Gold's Gym in Santa Monica. And I guess I had a moment of feeling, feeling myself, you know, I want Mr. Merga, baby, you know, I'm still young, 21 years old, baby workout, and I heard this voice behind me, a baritone voice, TP, get to work, you ain't did shit. And he turned and walked away, so I turned around, it was Robbie Robinson, and I was like, oh shit. So he lit, back down throughout he the He sure <laughs> did. He lit the fire. And I've been pushing ever since. And then I had the opportunity to train with him later. And he always said I was his best training partner. Because we were toe to toe. We were laughing at each other between sets. <laughs> Just sort of motivating. Trying to, no, trying to burn each other out. Right. Really trying, it's, it's, a, it's a challenge. And we were just kind of grand, you know. He said I was his best training partner. I don't quit. He didn't quit. He was 10 years older. Okay. And I was learning everything he was teaching me. You know, I would pick it up. He said once, got it. The first time I learned that muscle and mind connection worked or believe, because I never heard of it, is watching him do a, a deadlift one day. He had 500 pounds on the bar and he, he pulls it off the floor and he, he stumbled a little bit with it. So he had to step forward. Halfway up, he stepped forward and then he locked it. And I went, and I stood looking at him like, oh, it's mental. That's when my mind, my mind clicked in. This is mental. It's not just working out with weights. You're connected. And that helped me so much. It still does. Watching his face. He was doing laddles with cables one day, and I'm just standing watching his face. So now I see. Because I used to watch him at the gym for two years. Some days he's training light. Some days he's training heavy. Some days he's training moderate. And then he's changing all the exercise. We always were training. I was very intuitive as a kid. I, 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 you know, I, I can pick up stuff. And I sit back and watch, and I get it. Okay. But I couldn't figure out why he would train with light weights and still grow right in front of me. I couldn't figure it out. Then I go, oh, this is mental. And his form was perfect. So those are the two keys of getting a, a good body fast within time. And always free weights. Mm. 
very, we had cables and free weights. We didn't have machines back in those days. You pick up stuff off the floor heavy. You know? <laughs> there was no cable. You know? So that's when I recognized bodybuilding is mental. You're, you're creating art, you're, you're sculpting your body, but you, gotta, you need to learn your body as well too. And your body continues to change, especially as we age. Mm. Like you were talking about my training then and now, completely different. But you gotta listen to your body. Mm. You know, people just copy everybody else. Oh, he's doing that, that must work. And does it really work for you? You gotta find out what works for you. I'm a trainer, so when people come to me for, for sessions. I said, I need to learn your body first. Well, I'll do this and this, and that doesn't work for you. Let's try this, and then let's try that. And now I said, okay, now I got enough exercises, this is just gonna work for you. Yeah. And everybody's different. I know Frank talked when I interviewed him, he was he used to really put a lot of time, even to this day, on the on his mind and how he used to have to think about the muscle and it was you know, I, I it always fascinated me how important that was for him. And and when he was you know, when he when he lost and he was talking about his mental state and what he was going through, he used to he told me um, what, what was the word? He, he, he was telling me when he was in Palm Springs and he, he slipped and, and damaged himself. And, um, and I can't remember the word he was, he kept saying like, oh, are you taking the piss or something? And, and he kept saying this word over and then he slipped and fell and injured himself before one of the competitions. And he, 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 that was obviously a turning point for him. But he said, like, whatever you say, whether it's good or bad, that is kind of like what your mind starts believing. and, and he does all these rituals now just to make sure that his mind's always um, clear, clean, yeah, and, and not drifting off thinking thoughts that, um, that, that are not good for him. And, and is that something for you then? Because I guess probably your mind could easily drift in terms of are you worthy? And um, you, you must, there, there must have been these sort of questioning thoughts based on kind of your upbringing. Did, did that... Were you able to sort of shut that out of your life as you started to compete and get better and develop your own confidence? Yes, you mentioned I could have gone down the bad path or the good path, and I and I chose bodybuilding as my path, and I think that saved my life. It really has a positive influence, and I surrounded myself with all the pros, and they would always, you know, I was like the kid in the bunch, mm -hmm. kind of look after you, you know what I mean? So it was positive energy. I don't smoke, I don't do drink, I don't, you know, I don't do drugs, any of that stuff. So I just hung around those guys. Uh, yeah, negative thoughts, you know, bring you down. It's what is your mindset. And I set my mind that I wanted to be a world champion. I remember I had I was walking to Muscle Beach and I said out loud, what do I need to do to be the best in the world? And the first thought that came to mind was hard work. That was the first thought. And I was willing to do the work. Yes, I don't mind doing the work. But that's I think if you speak it out loud, then that's going to help you too. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you, I, I, me and Frank and I can relate on the same page here. This mind control, you know, it takes a lot to beat your body up every day. That's mental. Some people, what happens, people get burnt out. And they start turning to alcohol and, and pills to bring you up and pills to bring you down. Because mentally, they don't have the mindset. You know, I took nothing. I was, couldn't wait for the second workout or third, you know what I mean? It was just a way of life. So if you, it, it, bodybuilding is a tough sport. Mentally, you got to have it, and you got to have the heart and the discipline. And you know, you sacrifice almost everything. And if you don't, if you can't do that, you're not going to make it. You're going to be short-lived. You might rise to the top, but you don't stay. Mm. So I stayed 20 years. Mindset. You know, I'm not going anywhere. You tell yourself, I'm not going anywhere. Win, lose, or draw, I'll be back. I did a competed last year. Yeah, what is it, 63 you competed in? Yeah. Yes, but that's your mindset. And, t and honestly, I quit twice last year. It was a pandemic year, thing was chaotic. I was not getting in shape the way I thought I should be that age. Twice I looked in the mirror and I said, I can't do it. Really? I did. What, what do you think kind of, do you think that part of being in the pandemic and being locked up sort of caused you to question whether you could do it? No, no, but what I said to myself after that, you have never quit and you're not going to quit now. <laughs> and that's why I continued on. How long was that? What was that period to sort of tell That was yourself? the whole year. I, I knew I was going to compete because I went to the, to the show the year before 
I'm sitting here in Vegas at the contest, and the promoter came. He, he wrote me a letter later, and he said, hey, next year, I saw you at the show, and you look pretty good, and would you like to compete next year? And I go, yes. Because I was sitting there watching the show, and I go, hmm, I think I could get up there, you know. <laughs> I'm not too far still away. Still <laughs> You know, well, I don't know. I don't know. You don't, you don't know. Right. I think I still got it. You know, sometimes people think they still got it. It's like boxers. Yeah. I still got it, but they don't have it. Just for bodybuilders too. Oh yeah, I, I, I can still do. No, so much work involved, and the age factor. I realize the age. Is, and I said twice I can't do it, and the last time I said you'd have never quit, and you're not gonna quit now, because I would never, you know, I, I, I would hate myself for the rest of my life if I really quit. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I used to travel around the world doing shows. I told the promoter I'll be there. I don't need a contract. My word is my word. So, yeah, I got on stage, and uh, that was the greatest challenge ever. It was, I think it was body fat, maybe 3%. I pulled it together, but it's been rough coming back. The last year, I'm like, wow, it took a lot out of me. The age factor is real. It's serious. I mean, I know the exercises you do. I know how to push myself. I don't need a training partner. I don't need a coach. I know what I have to do to, to get to that level. And most is diet. I starve myself. I ate just enough to keep the muscles full, but I cut the carbs. I didn't have fats. I did whatever I needed to do. I walked the park for an hour every day. I did, I never missed a day. Seven days a week. It was straight through from March till November. Oh. Never missed a day. Even in the pandemic, I would go to the park and do pull-ups. I... I had two dumbbells. I did squats for the legs. Oh, you didn't? You weren't able to go into the gym some of that? No. Wow. So still preparing for the show, though, because in the back of my mind, it says, you're going to do this. You're going to get there. So what was it like winning the universe at age 63? Was it 40 years from when you made your, your pro debut? Is that right? Right. It was 40 years later that I won in London Universe. <laughs> exactly 40 years later. It was a good feeling, you know. Yeah. And then I, but at that moment, I go, it's done. You're done. My mom told me, she said, you need to stop this. She's so wise. She's 89 years old. But, but 10 years ago, she said, you need to stop this because your dehydration, training yourself the way she knows how I train, mm -hmm. this crazy training, and your body just not built for it, you know, because you don't listen. <laughs> but last year, I go, mom's right. That was it. So what's your, mo what's your kind of fitness motivation now? Is it more about other, other people or? Yes, helping other people, and I'm, and I'm thrilled when I see my clients smile and they see their bodies changing. This kid walked in yesterday, he's from Alabama, he says, and I said, look at you, man, you're like, he goes, yeah, I'm growing. Because his chest is filled out, his shoulders are round, his arms and biceps, biceps are bigger. He goes, yeah, the most, this is my leg development, you know, he didn't have the legs. And, I, and that makes me proud that I know that it still works. Yeah. Basic training. There's none, I, you know, there's a lot of cosmetic training. Maybe I could talk about that for a second. There's a lot of cosmetic training where you're doing one on cables and concentration curls. And see, George Turner throw you out to gym for that. Really? You didn't build anything. What do you mean you're doing a concentration curl? You got a 12 inch arm. <laughs> That's what he would say. Get on the preacher bench, curl some 100 pound dumbbells or barbells, you know, four or five sets on the preacher, do some hammer curls, and then finish off your little concentration curl. Do some work for us. I see them in the gym all the time. It's just mind blowing that they're never going to. The problem is, you're not going to build a foundation if you don't do some, if you don't challenge your muscles, if you don't challenge them to build a foundation. And your legs is the foundation. But training your chest and arms as well. You got to bench, dip, flies, press, you know, do some serious stuff, not cross over cables. So gonna... what's your view about the heavy versus light? I know like you've had some people that have gone extremely heavy on one side and done a lot of damage. You know, we, we know who they are. Mm -hmm. um, how it, is that age related or would you know, would you train heavier when you're younger and, and light when you're older? Or would you just sort of train in a way that's kind of healthy through the whole thing of, you know, knowing what you know now? It's training in a way that you're healthy always all the way through. But when you're young, and I, and I did the same thing. You, you want to test to see how strong you are. And if you find that you're strong, now you get a feel for that, you know, because there's a man with egos. <laughs> but I was taught the form has to be correct. As long as you got good form 
it's okay. If you're going to throw the weights around, cheat, you're going to hurt yourself. You're going to burn out. So when you're training for a show, you want to train, or just in general, you want to train with moderate weights, heavy, and light. And I learned it from Roddy. He said, you cannot train heavy all the time. You're going to burn out or you're going to injure yourself. He said, the weight's not going to break. You are, eventually. And that's why all these intertorn pecs in the shoulders and legs, that's what's happening. They're so caught up to lifting heavy, 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 heavy. Your body's going to give. It's going to break. Mm. That's what's going to happen. So, moderate workouts, sometimes heavy workouts, light workouts. And you mix all the two. How do you go you know, full year, training almost every day, training heavy? You can't. Psychologically, you can't. So you gotta, you know what I mean? It's mental too. But I would recommend a combination of all of those, and mostly moderate weight, moderate to heavy, with good form. How do you find good form? Learn good form. Good trainer. Find a good trainer to teach you form. Not going online looking for people who's training. Where do they learn it from? I go online all the time and I watch people train. I go wrong, wrong. The wrist is off. Came down too far. This is off. That's off. And it's always about an inch. That's my client. Off by that much. The getting 100% or getting 80% out of the movement. Every rep that I do, every set that I do, I want 100%. I don't have time. Just hanging out at the gym. They go to the gym for two hours. 45 minutes to an hour, you should be done. One hour, two body parts. That means you're not resting between sets two minutes. You know... Boxers go into the ring, they get one minute in that corner. Yeah, you're right. They're getting punched in the face. We get two minutes in bodybuilding. I can get on the phone, and you know, I can put my wrist straps on, I can talk, get the music going. Okay, I'm now ready for the next set. If that was happening to me, I want to go home because I'm bored. So the intensity of the workouts gives you muscle development. You need intensity. That's how the body grows, and that's your foundation for life. You know, I have a guy, he's 67 years old, he never worked out a day in his life. He's really impressed where he's coming along so fast. But it's, it's you know, you have to, there's a pace. You have to, like you run at a pace. You train at a pace. You know, guys take two or three minutes between sets. Of course I can do 500 pounds if I got three minutes rest. No, we're gonna get 45 seconds. So I'm going to go on, on uh, Instagram and challenge the strong guys. I want you to do deadlifts, 300 pounds, three plates on each side. I want you to do five sets of 12. But the bar, can, the weight cannot touch the floor. We're not going to slam the floor. We're going to do the deadlifts, 12 reps, five sets. And you've got 45 seconds rest between. This is training. That's the challenge. 300 pounds is nothing for them. They do five, six, eight, nine hundred pounds. 300 should be like a toy. But you'll see, 45 seconds rest is the part that's gonna get you. Yeah. And that's how I burned out my training partners. You got 30 seconds rest. I would train with Robbie, he would take a 100 pound barbell, curl it 12 times, and hand it to me. I curl it 12 times, I hand it to him. So how much rest did I get? That's intense. So is that, I know you talk about not doing traditional cardio. Is that part of it is that you're getting your, elevating your heart rate through that? Because my, my guess is that type of training is pretty short, short rest and you're lifting a lot of weight is, is, is going to elevate your heart pretty high anyway. I'm yes, sorry. that was it. I don't do cardio. For this show last year, I, didn't, I just walked the park. I didn't do cardio. It was intense of the, of the training. If you're doing it twice a day in that level of intensity, you're burning some calories. Yeah. You know, and, and your diet's good. You can, you, you'll get in shape, guarantee. No, so all the cardio, no. You don't really need it. They, didn't, they need to step up the pace in the training. Come on, guys, pick it up. Come on. You're going to the gym to work. You know, they go with, they got, they got the wrist straps on, they got the music, got the belt, they got the water. You know, they got it. <laughs> it's like luxury. It's like you go into a party. I'm the Mike Tyson. No socks. No robe, <laughs> you know, no nothing. I got no scraps. You know, I didn't shave. I don't have designer clothes on. <laughs> I'm going to the gym to work. When I go out, I can put my designer clothes on. I can play my music. Mm -hmm. 
You know, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. You well, go, business and... Right, you go to the gym to work. And all these young people, I see a lot of guys with great genetics, but I watch them train and go, you don't have it. You don't have it here. And I go, he's had a good life. This is why I determine that he has a really good life because he don't know what hard work means. He never experienced it. So that's, that, that's the issue. If you, if you don't know what hard work, I was taught hard work. And George, you know, make that for sure. So I knew what, it, what that was. But I got but to get used to it. Mm. I've been training with, I trained with Bill Grant. I trained with uh, Ken Wall. I trained with Robbie Robinson. And a lot of these pros, and that's the way they trained. If you slack for a second, you cut out the door. You know, you're sad. <laughs> they just look at you. I was a kid, remember? They just looked at you. I never forget this. I was training with Robbie one day, and this kid comes over, a little blonde kid, and he's he is adjusting his wristbands, <laughs> adjusting his shirt, got on the T-bar, adjusting his shirt, he fixed his hair. <laughs> Robbie's sitting on the bench, he goes, pick up the fucking weight. <laughs> That's what I said. Just get on with it. That's all he said, pick up the fucking weight. <laughs> I mean, you know, he's a man of few words. What he said to me that day, and then just, you know, two more. I mean, you know, he didn't say much, but what he said was always enough to get you through. He knew mm -hmm. exactly what to say. And then he knew exactly when to back off, too. A lot of trainers today destroy their clients because they're trying to prove something. A new client is a new client. He doesn't want to be in bed for a week because he can't walk after the first workout. So, you know, you got to be really smart, and, you know, take care of your clients and Give them just enough. I train them just enough. When you wake up tomorrow, I want you to know you worked out, but you're not sore. You can feel it. Yeah, I felt it. Yeah, mm. I can feel this. Oh, okay. And then gradually you kind of build from that. It's like a baby coming to you. Mm. This guy's 767. He's like a baby. Never touched a weight in his life. So but now you're starting to get, eh. yeah. after two weeks ago, yeah, I'm starting to get on. So when you're, when you're training to build that classic physique, which is what you mm. had and Frank Zane had and a number of others, what are some of the muscles that you, you don't focus on as much or you shouldn't try and train? I've, I've heard you sort of reference a few things, but are there any sort of, um, you know, in, in order to kind of re retain those lines, are there things that you probably put more focus on and things that you probably put less? Maybe that's a better way of putting it. That's a great question. I'm so glad you asked that question. <laughs> Can't wait to jump on it. Okay, <laughs> number one, stop training your traps. Because when you look at Serge Dubre, you know who that is? Yes, I do. And you look at Frank Zane, and you look at Steve Reeves, you look at these classic, beautiful bodies. Do you notice their traps? No. There's nowhere to be found. Or the massive forms, they don't have that. Or the oblique muscles sticking out here, they don't have that. But that takes away, it, it distracts from the whole physique. When you see a class of physique, and I'm gonna take Nubre, it's a chest, full chest, mm -hmm. round shoulders, the separation of detail. All the muscles are individual, but still tied together perfectly in the waistline. And, and genetic plays a huge part because some people have long torsos or short legs or bow-legged or weak, really short biceps. Some of those things you just can't change. Mm -hmm. But like I said, I'm blessed, really blessed that God gave me structure. He says, I'm giving you this structure, but I'm not, I'm not gonna give you the legs. I'm not gonna give you the chest or tricep. You have to go build that. You know how hard it is to build your legs? Yes. When you got skinny legs? Yes. Yeah. That's how much work that I had to do. Now, I know some pros that do two, two sets, you know, every couple of weeks. And legs are phenomenal. So I'm jealous. It, it, it's it's to like legs and calves, even when I used yes. to train and still do now to this day. And it's it's I think now it's kind of something I'm pretty good at but I always just naturally I had these really really skinny legs so like every every little bit of progress was just through like I have to train them all the time you know three or four times a week and yes. I, I've got to put some effort in whereas yes. other things you can kind of leave R respond pretty quickly <laughs> right right but I, they're the worst things to kind of have to train because they're the most they well they, they feel as though they're the most difficult although I do get quite a nice now um, it's 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 if when when life's tough cracking out and succeeding a good leg workout kind of makes everything else seem a bit easier <laughs> exactly exactly so those three body parts personally i don't think aesthetically pleasing your bleats massive form when your forearms are bigger than your biceps 
No. Or when your triceps are much bigger than your biceps, there should be a balance. If I would, I would be a bad judge because I go, biceps weak. Great triceps, go build the biceps. Mm -hmm. Or the shoulders are not round enough, or the traps are too big. Everything has to be like in harmony and nothing really stands out. And that's what Steve Reeves and Zane and Samir and all these guys got. You, nothing really jumps out at you. But all together is like perfect. Mm. That's what class of physique is. And you want, something you can't develop is a sweep of the valleys of the muscles. The round is Danny Padilla, the, the little giant killer. His, all of his muscles are round and full. You know, that's genetics. You can't build that. But balance and proportion means a lot. So what about chess? Because I know you've said before that you, you, it wasn't bench that you used to kind of develop your chest. No. So what, what was your uh, secret there to build it up? Because it was a weak point for a period, wasn't it? Huge. Because George, I never benched at George's gym. He said pull-ups and squats. That was it. <laughs> and you wouldn't dare do anything else <laughs> and throw you out the gym. So I got to LA. I'm at Gold's Gym in Santa Monica, and I'm doing bench press, and my shoulders are hurting every single time I try to bench. I go to Robbie before I start training with him. I said, Robbie, what can I do? He says, well, dips. Dumbbell flies, pullovers, and dumbbell presses. And that's what I did for one year. And my chest grew. And then I went back to the bench and I felt it mm. without using my shoulders. So on the dip bar, heavy dumbbell presses, dumbbell flies, and dumbbell pullovers, which I completely stopped doing dumbbell pullovers as you get older. You gotta be smart because it's pulling the shoulders out. So those are the four exercises to build my chest. So yeah, he. Uh, that's, that was great advice. Mm. And a lot of people probably got that same problem. I was never strong on the bench. <laughs> no way. I could pull more than I could push. I could deadlift a lot of weight. I could squat, but I can't, I can't bench. Right. Dumbbells, the most I ever done is like 145s in each hand. Kind of slight incline. I thought that was good, you know. Mm -hmm. I have a very small frame, very small structure. I used to get chiro go to the chiropractor and he's working on me, he goes, your frame is so small under all this muscle. How did you pack that on? You know what I mean? So I got a real t tiny frame. So what about arms? What, what was your sort of go-to exercises to develop your arms? Because you had some pretty, we still have pretty impressive arms and your, your bicep was... Uh, I appreciate it. it was, um, biceps was standing Bobby or curls, and all this is from Robbie. Um, Stan, he loves the standing Bobby or curl, preacher curls straight bar or easy curl bar either one both works uh and alternating dumbbell curls but now i do them both at the same time but alternating dumbbell curls the mistake people are making on those they come down and they rotate when you rotate there's no pressure on the bicep now right. and then you bring it back so the idea was to come down and don't rotate keep the tension on the bicep keep the tension every time i do this it's relaxing and then I see guys curling and girls, they curl like this. So what are you doing? See how my body's moving? So my body's doing all the work, bicep's doing nothing. So you stand up straight and you curl it with your bicep. Oh, uh, can I talk about the drag curl? Yes, yeah, go on, yeah, because I've seen a lot of this online recently. Uh, what should you do on that? Uh, the drag curl. So let's take the, the, the preacher bitch and throw it out the gym, because obviously it doesn't work anymore. That's, yeah. Now, in order to engage your bicep, to develop your bicep, you have to get the bicep away from your body, just like the preacher bench. Right. That's the whole idea. So when you're standing with the barbell or dumbbell, it's got to be here, and you're going to lift the arm up, the elbow up from the body. You're going to pull in so you can contract the peak of the bicep. If I stop here, I don't have my peak yet. i got to get it to here. That means the bar is at my chin. There is the peak. That's how you get it. The arm must be away from your body. You can't, if I pull, drag the bar up like this, you see my traps went up, mm -hmm. my shoulders are flexing, my back's flexing, biceps getting that much. So it's, and it's showing, but it's showing on stage now. The guy's right. biceps are weak. And I go, they're not curling. There's one guy I want to call out so bad and help him out, because he's a legend. Go on in. <laughs> Sergio Lee, Virginia. Right. 
and I watch him curl and do his biceps. Triceps are phenomenal. I just want to get him on the preacher bench and make it spend 10 hours on that thing. <laughs> I wouldn't let him off it. You're going to curl, there, you're going to curl this thing until the cows come home. Uh, we're going to get, you know what I mean? So that's how I get my biceps. When I was a kid, I had decent biceps. Um, there's a picture of me in high school um, that I was doing this. I was the best built kid in school in my yearbook. And I had a little biceps, but I had no tricep. So genetically, I had bicep, but I, of course, I had to build it. I mean, it wasn't always, you know, I had to, it's a lot of work building your bicep. And, and the arms are not easy to build. There, it's a lot of work. Mm. I'm exhausted from training biceps when I go home because you put so much into it. Mm. Oh, and don't overtrain them. These guys, I did 21 sets of biceps. Oh, from here to here, 21 sets, really? That means he's using other body parts. Because if you really isolate your bicep, about eight to 10 sets, they're done. You know what I mean? Like I said, you make eight to 10 sets, maybe three different exercises, they should be completely pumped, done. Anything past that, now you're defeating your purpose. Right. You're there too long. Are you, is that eight to 10 what you're using for all body parts? Like yes, legs, eight, back. eight, 10 to 12 reps. Eight, 10 to 12, yes. Sets and reps. Sets and reps. Right. Legs, I'm doing more reps. I'm doing maybe eight sets, four sets of regular squats and four sets of sumo squats with a moderate weight, but the volume of reps is high, like 15, even 20 per mm. set. Wow. I'm like you, I'm trying, still trying to hold on to my legs. <laughs> so yeah, that- When you get older, it's- uh, It's uh, even harder. Uh, yeah. As we age. Yeah. Glutes and- And the legs. Quads. For men, they, it starts yeah, to go. Yeah. And it I'm, doesn't look good either in, it, in it shorts. It looks terrible. <laughs> This is why I'm, I'm still in my age, still in the <laughs> squatting. I don't care if it's a damn bar, I'm going to squat the bar. Yeah. <laughs> Just trying to hold on to the size of the legs. So, so the more reps, for sure a lot less, uh, less weight. And, and, and locking out. This is so important, guys. Stop locking out. I'm on Facebook, social media. I'm watching all you guys on Instagram. They lock out between every rep. Whatever happened to continuous tension on the muscle? If you apply that, you're gonna grow 10 times faster. If you squat 145 pounds and you squat parallel to the floor, if you come up too high, you, you squat, you're gonna come about that much. It's a very short range of movement. So that tension on your quads is intense. You yeah, do it's it, intense. You do it 15 <laughs> times <laughs> and you do 10 sets of that. Your leg's gonna explode when you walk out of the gym. They think when I walk out and I squeeze my glutes, you're resting. You're resting. You'll be, and you're engaging your knees. Every time you walk out, the initial move is your knees. You're engaging your joints. So when you don't lock out, you're saving your joints. Right. What about leg press? Do you, do you, are you a believer in that? Leg all? press is really good. I stopped leg pressing because my guy advised me to because my back was a mess at the end. So I haven't, but when you leg press, same thing. Don't lock out. And you don't need a thousand pounds to build the legs. You just don't. It's all show. You put 500 pounds in there. And what I would do, I would do leg extensions, do some sumo squats, and then go leg press. Mm. So you do maybe four or five sets, maybe four plates on each side, max. 10, 12 reps, 10, 12 reps. But don't lock out. And do it slow. I see the guys, the weight's falling, and they do all this weight come. Where's the mind connection? So everything you do has to be slow and controlled. I had some clients come to me, and they walk away, and it goes, because your training is too slow, they said. And, I, and, and, and it's boring. It's not exciting. I go, okay, and they leave. <laughs> they don't understand it. But to develop muscle, it, it is slow. The longer the muscle's under tension, the faster it's gonna respond. It's gonna grow. Is it gonna hurt more? Yes. When you slow down the exercise to do 12 reps and do them really slow and controlled, it's gonna hurt more. That's what you want. That's why you're at the gym. Those last three reps on that preacher bench, I got my clients, I'm spotting him, but I give him just enough. I give him just enough to keep it moving. So, this be like an eternity to get this thing up here. That's when it grows. 
So what about bands then? Because that gives, have you, do, do you, um, Frank's, when I went into his gym, he hooks bands up on some of his machines either, and, even, and I've, I've been doing some stuff recently with bands, and okay. it's quite nice in terms of the tension that you get when you okay. combine that with like a barbell and a dumbbell. Mm -hmm. Um, and I've been experimenting that with that, but have you found good results by combining bands with, with free weights at all? Or? I've never used a band. you never? Okay. No. But I can see the combination of the two. Don't just rely on the bands. Do the real free weights first and then finish with the bands. I get it. Mm. That works. I mean, in a pandemic or any other situation of traveling and that's all you have is bands, perfect. Mm. But if you have the opportunity to have real weights, free weights, the combination definitely works. Yeah, but personally, I've never used a band. Give me the barbell. You know, you know what I mean? I just, no, no. <laughs> and, and weights versus machines then, are you, are you, you still a, more of a free weight fan? A hundred percent. Why is yeah. that? Because back in my day, we didn't have a lot of machines. We had cables and free weights. And you improvise, you create stuff, real stuff none of this cosmetic stuff they're doing now no no uh free weights for sure because it forces you to concentrate harder it forces the muscles to work harder the stabilizing muscle has to work your core has to work more it's a lot it's harder it's, it's, it's work to do on a machine you put the pin in if you fail you just drop it you know you pull back machines it doesn't give you the same muscularity or the detail in the muscles as free weights you can tell a guy who, who trained with free weights for a long time because you can see the striation, the cross striation, the muscle separation, and the deepness of the muscles and the hardness of the muscle. It shows. That guy did some real, like Beckles for one. Mm. You know, it, it's, it's, it's intense. You can see just carved out of <laughs> stone. That means he did a lot of free weights. Okay. Machines, weight training, the guys get big, they look kind of soft. The muscles look like watery. And they don't have those real striations. We used to have striations on top of striations. You know what I mean? The pegs cut, it's cut, more cuts on top of the cuts. That's what, that's what uh, back in my day, that's what they wanted. So, free weights, absolutely. And it just makes you work harder, that's all. Yeah. And you get faster results. Remember that. So, you, you say, I've, I've heard you reference something called instinctive training. What, what, what's that? You walk into the gym, I'm going to do chest and back today, I have no idea what we're going to do. Oh, okay, let's start here. That's instinctive training. You know, your body kind of tells you. And, and you're going to work that weak body part too. You want to hit the body part from all different angles. So when you do flex, things happen. Crazy stuff happen. You know, I weighed about 185 pounds, 190 on stage, and they all swore when he flex, things really come out. From different direction, I trained for that. No accident. You hit the muscles after learning from the pros. You hit that muscle from all different angles. And when you flex, the flex is going to roll up, going to roll here, going to roll there, going to roll there. All those striations. In the back, the same thing. Really straight it, really deep. All chills, 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 all and and depth. The thickness of the middle of the back. When you, I mean, crazy back shots. Le Leon Brown. This is a, a list of guys. Shamir, one of the best backs ever. Free weights and instinctive training. If you have a set program in your head, your body's got to adjust to that. Yeah. You know the routine. It's like sleepwalking. They walk into the gym and say, okay, this, this, that, this, exercise. And people, I don't write programs for people. If you follow the program, you're going to go nowhere. You go in, just mix it up. I tell my clients, we're going to do something every day different. They go, okay. Because that's how you shock the body to grow. They said, I hit the wall. I don't know what to do. You know, I peaked out. No, you need to change the program. Change the mindset. Mm -hmm. Say you come in, you squat. And then you do leg extensions, leg press and lunges. Next day, you start out with hamstrings. Two more squats, you know, and leg press. Just keep changing it. So the muscles like confused mm -hmm. all the time. And mentally it's good too to change it up. Yeah, yeah. Right. Don't get bored, do you? That's, right. That's so instinctive thing. training. Yeah. That's what and that's what all the guys talked about back in the day and I'm still doing it. So one of the things that I think I wanted to talk about now is like supplementation. Like yeah. 
in terms of what you used to take and what you probably take now in terms of you know, protein, vitamins, is there any, any things that you've found over that career that's, that's just really worked well and that you would recommend? This is gonna be shocking. I don't take a lot of vitamins. I take the basic vitamins, B complex, B12, a multivitamin, uh, C, zinc. That's about it. And a protein shake, maybe mm -hmm. once a day. And my, when I was competing, I would, I would for sure had protein shakes, but only one a day. How much would you put in? How much protein would you put in there? Maybe one, two scoops. Right. Um, but I didn't rely on that. You got to eat your real food, you know, five or six times a day. So this is not the real food. Protein bars, no. Um, all this other stuff on the mark, no. Creatine, no. Pre-workouts? No. Guys, this is your pre-workout. <laughs> On the way to the gym, you can't talk to me, even now. So, when I'm going to the gym, my mind's preparing. I get that look on my face. I'm preparing what I'm going to do from that day until now. I'm going to the gym, I'm doing legs, I'm doing back, and I'm in a zone before I even get there. That's your pre-workout. I don't care how, sometimes I'm tired too. I've worked all day as well, and I'm exhausted. What did I say? Just do the warm-up set. If I could just get the warm-up set. And then the switch comes on. And then I, and I have the best workout ever. Yeah. I was so tired. Yes. So did you ever do coffee or anything like that? I have to confess, when I was competing, I would drink two cups of coffee every morning. Right. No food. And then I told you about my training partner. Uh, he would go, big boys, go get them. So he smoked his pot. Yeah. <laughs> I had my coffee. <laughs> and we were ready to go. <laughs> Two crazy fools going to the gym. <laughs> and we would challenge each other, like, just like brutal. Just doggy dog. Just go, who, die, who cares? <laughs> I'm in my 20s, early 30s. So, yeah, no, no, there's no, I'm not against people taking it. My clients take through the pre workout, so I'm not against it. Just personally, I don't need it. Mm. It's just all here. Mental, yeah. It's mental. It's, it's, it's once again the mindset. You know what you got to do. Just go do it. Mm. Don't talk about it and don't overthink it. <laughs> People go, you know what I mean? I do it too. I catch myself. Ah, oh, legs today. Hmm. Ah, my knees hurt. Oh, my back's hurt. You know what I mean? My hips. You know what I mean? I got these little aches and pains. I still got to do legs. I, I go and I, I, I do it. I go and do it. I remember one time my back was hurting me so bad at the house. I'm like, man, my back's killing me. You know what I said? I'm gonna go train back. That's what I did. <laughs> I got dressed, went in there and trained my back. Next day I felt fine. So it's all up here. Yeah, it is. Yeah. It really is. It's, it's funny how the mind works. So I'm not against pre-workout, don't take me wrong. I'm not against you doing all this creatine and all this, uh, you know, all this stuff you, you take, uh, amino acids and all this thing. It's fine. I'm not against it. It's personally, I don't think I need it. No. You know how many people tell me I need to take this, you need to take that. Even now, you should be taking this. I gotta just eat my food. It's not that complicated. So what about what about steroids? I'm sure you've talked about this before and I know you've got views on them, but what, what's your thoughts to get to that universe, Olympia level, like how is that required and and, and do you think well, it's kind of two questions. Is that required? Um, um, you know, what, what did you do when you were in that stage? Was that ever any, anything you got involved with? I can only talk about in my career back in the day. I was so afraid of it. You know, put stuff in my body from the way I was raised. Come on. You know, you're going to be taking steroids. You know, you know what I mean? I was afraid that I'm going to damage myself. I'm not going to say that I didn't because I did. I took a little bit. But, you know, I won Mr. America clean. No one gave me drugs for Mr. America contest. I'm not, gonna, I'm not the guy to win. I was a nobody, you know, and I just trained hard as I could and diet as hard as I could. I remember training for Mr. America. I was lying in my bed every night and my stomach was touching my backbone. That's how hungry I was. I remember that. I was starving, but I didn't quit. So I got condition-wise, I got in the best condition humanly possible but I didn't have any steroids in me. So I won the contest. And then, see there was no internet. 
Right. So I might whisper something in the ear occasionally. I said, okay. But I was afraid, and I took the smallest amount possible because I always believed just do the work. And I said to myself, I'm on, but I'm going to handle the same weights when I'm off and the same weights when I'm on. I told myself that. So on drugs or without drugs, I'm going to pick up the same amount of weights. And then I was told, when you're on, you have to train the hardest. You give every ounce of you to train your hardest. So when you do come off, you, be, you are able to maintain some of that, that new growth. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I did. And then I remember in the late 80s, they said, that's it. I'm done. No more. I'm done. And then, guess what? 91, 92, I joined this other federation, WBF. And I was the biggest and more cut, cuts that I had ever been. Clean. And that is proof because he tested you by phone call. You go to the lab now. So all the pros, you remember the WBF? The World Bodybuilding Federation? Vince yeah. McMahon? Oh, uh, okay, yeah. Yes. I was a jet man. They call you overnight to the lab. And if you're positive, you don't get your paycheck for the month. I was clean the whole time. And that was the biggest and the most cut I've ever been, drug free. Near the, really near the end of my career, because I retired in 94. Two years later, I was I'm done. What were the drugs that people, what were the, the steroids that people were taking at that time? What were the popular ones? Like Prima Ballin, Decaderoblin, Anabar. Very basic stuff. There was not a lot of stuff to take. I mean, that's why we had to work so hard. <laughs> You know, to build muscle and eat as much as you can. Yeah. You know what I mean? There was very few. Oh, I'm sure there was stuff that I knew it didn't know anything about. Yeah, I was still the kid. You know, you take a little this, this, and this, and a little vitamin C. You know, be complex with it. Oh, okay, okay. You know, like a kid. But no, but honestly, I was afraid that it was going to damage me. And then I said to myself, I was pretty wise as a kid. I don't know where I got that from. I'm going to retire one day, and they're going to forget all about me. And they did. I remember the day the phone stopped ringing. You know, for 20 years, your phone's ringing, exhibitions, seminars, competitions, appearances, and, and then nothing. I'm looking at the phone. And that's what happened. You were out of the game, and a new guy comes in. It's kind of like Hollywood. Out with the old, I wrote that in the book, out with the old, in with the new. And I bet I knew that from the start. I don't know how I knew that. I said, yeah, they're going to totally forget all about you. You're nobody. And I go, then I'm going to be sitting there with all these health issues because I took all that stuff. Mm. You know, and I, and, 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 and there's some part of me going, I don't really need to if I just work hard enough. So I did the work. And you, you know, you're an example of that even at this age. You know, I, I'm, I'm sure you've got some... Aches and pains like everyone, but... Um, yes, sir. <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> but, you know, you're, you're still great. How old are you now? Oh, uh, I'm 63. I'll be... No, I'm 64. See? Oh, 64. <laughs> I'll be 65 January. Can you imagine? I mean, just to think of that number, just mind-blowing for me. Because I remember when I was in my 20s and my 30s. When I turned 40, like, oh, my God, I'm so old. I remember 40. I remember, like, yeah. yesterday... I am so old, but, but 50 really got me. Yeah, that's so I'm kind of I go, oh, now. man, I'm 50. My sister sent me a birthday card. She's so sweet. I opened the card, and the big 5-0 was written in. <laughs> <laughs> I took the card and threw it across the room. <laughs> We're going backwards in our age now. Okay? <laughs> you right. right. <laughs> I went, oh, my God, I threw it across the room. But now I would, I would love to go back to 50. <laughs> right, yeah. So... So you know, what's the secret in sort of staying, you know, young and sexy in your 60s then? Once again, a mindset. If you start thinking that you're old and acting old, you become old. So the whole time I was training for the show last year, in my head I was 30. I trained with the same type of intensity as much as I could, you know, with the injuries and all. But I kept saying I'm 30. I never thought, oh, you're 63 years old. It's going to be tough. No, I was 30. And even now, I guess they had a great back workout going, and okay, it's nice to have those moments when everything was just clicking right on. So, ooh, that was okay, that was good. 
But then you got to be real smart and listen to your body. Don't overdo it. Because for the next three days, you're going to be in pain. Mm. So you got to know when you're on the you really listen. When I'm training now, I am listening to my body when to stop. Don't, you know what I mean? Don't, don't add more weight. Do more reps. You know, just keep listening. And that's how you survive. I want to continue on. So, you know, I love weight training and just, I don't want to stop. I for sure don't want to stop training my legs. <laughs> that's, um, if I lose the arm or the chest, as long as I got the legs, I'm good. <laughs> yeah. And is there any, any diet stuff? Because I, I, I listened to a podcast where you said for, what is it, 20, 30 years, you're chicken and rice and very basic diet. Is still. That, still. <laughs> My family laugh at me. They come home and go, yeah, Tony, oh, yeah, okay, chicken and rice, we know. <laughs> that's about in the egg whites. That's pretty much what he's going to have. He comes home, and that's what he makes, and that's what I cook every day, chicken and rice. I got some bison burger now, oh, bison, nice, yeah. which I like. Uh, fish once in a while. My body seemed to be rejecting steak now. It's weird. Mm. It's the acid or something. It's age. Mm. So now I eat steak. I used to love a steak like every two weeks. I would have a nice steak. Mm. But now it's like I can't even have the steak. So chicken and rice is what I'm on. And the bison. Um, sometimes ground turkey. You know, less fat. On special uh, occasions. Right. I just kind of throw it in to mix it up. <laughs> right. And, and brown rice. Um, I'm starting to like oatmeal again. So that's good. So complex carbs and high protein and kind of watch the fats even though now I'm having a little bit of avocados yeah but all the nuts and the fat and stuff no you don't need it I mean Arnold said something he goes what are you going to gain from junk food and that's a real something to think about mm. nothing uh, comfort food it tastes good but you're not gaining any muscle from it so, uh, you know, I eat, I, I, before the show, I was eating my meals on time, every four hours at least, you know, having the meals. Now it's like whenever I'm hungry. Some like last night, I, I, didn't, I didn't even have dinner. Sometimes I'm hungry, sometimes I'm just listening to my body. Sometimes I want to eat, someday I'm starving all day long. So it depends. Mm. So I don't want to compete again, but I want to hold my size. So I'm trying to eat enough, just enough to hold on to the size. I don't want to get smaller. I don't want to get bigger. So why, why get bigger at your age and carry that extra weight? Mm, yeah, so maybe, no. Don't need it. No. People look at the gym. Somebody said to me, I went to the grand opening at the powerhouse gym, Iris Kyle's gym in Hide. Somebody looked at me and said, yeah, you kind of lost your chest. And I'm looking at this person like, you know what I mean? <laughs> it's funny how people tell you, so right to your face, I'm like, okay. Of course, next week I go back and train chest really hard. <laughs> Go beat up the chest. So, you know, you know, people don't understand it's just age factor. You start you start just to lose a little bit. Yeah. I'm not as strong. I don't want to be. My joints gonna hurt if I do train heavy. So you just gotta be smart. I try to protect my joints, use the muscles, and have this girl, you know, she's training for a show and people are surprised what you can do with five, ten, fifteen pound, twenty pound dumbbells. You're just amazed. Mm. I can get that kind of pump? Yes. At the old gym here in town, I was doing dumbbell curls. I had my 30-pound dumbbells curling. The guy down next to me, he's doing 65s. He's rocking them out. I was in pretty good shape. So he comes over. He goes, dude, look at your arms and bicep. Jeez. What do you max out with? I go, 30s. And he started laughing. <laughs> he goes, what? I go, yeah, that's my max weight. He's like, really? But what he didn't see, I kept the elbows in when I curled the dumbbell and twisted my wrist out. As you curl the dumbbell, you twist your wrist, and there's your peak. When you flex, what do you see? Your peak. And that's all I'm working is the peak. Everything I do is the peak. Bicep. That's what the judge is going to see. You're right? And you're doing it slower. I'm doing in. slow, control. As I lower the weight, both at the same time, I lean in slightly. That takes the pressure off the back. You're not using your back muscles. So I'll lean in just a little bit. And then I curl, turning my wrist. As I curl, I'm turning my wrist. I'm turning my wrist for the contraction. Elbows in tight. If your elbow's out here, you're using your shoulders. All these little things. So he didn't see that part that I'm doing. A lot of stuff that I do, people don't see. Like laterals. 
standing laterals. People do laterals like this. That's all forms. Correct my client today. Straighten out your wrist. Ah. Oh. But now because you're lifting with the arms. Straighten out the wrist. And then I said, as you get to the top, turn your wrist over. Pouring the coffee I got. Turn your wrist. She goes, oh, a better contraction. Yes. Five pounds. She had five pounds. She puts them down. Are you serious? I feel like a baby's learning all over again. That's what she said. Just those little things. So people don't see that. When I'm squatting, <laughs> I'm at LVOC a couple of weeks ago and I'm squatting. Eight o'clock at night, this girl squatting next to me. She's young. Oh, she's got almost 200 pounds on the bar. She's repping out. I got a 45 on each side. She's looking over. I, I, I'm squatting, but I can see her looking over at me. <laughs> almost like laughing. But she didn't see that I was in the squat position. I never locked out, and I was doing it slow. I'm doing 20 reps with it. My leg's going to explode, but she didn't see that part. Yeah. So people from the outside looking in, they don't know what you're doing. They just said, oh, he's doing it really slow, but super lightweight. So they don't know. So it's not about the weight. That's what I'm teaching it's my clients. It's about how you do it. Yes, yeah. that's what I'm teaching my clients. I'm not against training heavy, as long as your form's perfect. No. Michael Herndon, you know who that is? No. You don't know Michael Herndon? No. He's Ghost Gym in Venice. He weighs 275. He's, he was uh, a lot of, been, been in a lot of movies. Okay. He's a bodybuilder. Body he's huge. Small ways. He oh, has, Michael Hearn? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we've got, he's, he's going to be on our podcast, actually. Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah, he's an older guy as well, isn't he? Yeah, he's in, he's in great shape. I think he's in his 50s. He's yeah. in his 50s. He's got the best form ever. Right. With heavy weights. Um, just in awe. That's form. And that's some crazy ass heavy weight. Yeah, he's still, he's still doing it. Wow. So look, I know we've, we've gone on for a while, but I've, I've got one other question for you. Um, but before that, just uh, Tony, um, if for people who want to find out more about you, find out your book, where, where should they go? It's on Amazon. Go to Amazon and uh, you type in uh, Driven Tony Pearson. Is it Tony Pearson Driven? Tony Pearson Driven. And I mean, also my audio book is on there too. You can get my audio book. And it's on Kindle as well. It's right. on Kindle, yeah. yes, yes. It's on, uh, on, on Audible. So go to Amazon.com and just type in Tony Pearson Driven and uh, read my story. It's a great story. I'm, I'm thinking about doing a, ch uh, a child's kid's version of the book with a bunch of pictures to, as an inspirational book for kids. Because I was a child yeah. and I know what they're going through. And kids are going through the same type of stuff today. Mm. I find an article on the, on the internet where this, this, this kid died at two years old. This kid, three years old, it's still happening. But these kids are dying. I luck I survived, I lived. So, you know, I want to do this kid book. And like I said, every other page is going to be a picture of what I just wrote. Now, visually, you can see. Like, like I'm in the backyard pumping water that I wrote about, right? Did you read that part? Yeah. I'm pumping the water. You can see the shack. You can see the firewood that I just chopped. And then you see me on top of this hill pumping the bucket of water and the face expression on my face and it's a very dramatic scene so visually you can see pictures speaks a lot of thousand, thousand yeah. words although the words you create all these pictures which are which are, i don't know what's worse but yeah I, I guess for children it'd be nice to sort of be able to visually, to, to see. visually see that but yeah. just to give them an idea hey i can survive too that he survived without drugs alcohol jail or dead yeah because that's where i was headed you know, I went back to St. Louis, and please let me tell you this, I went back to St. Louis, they're doing a documentary about my life, and uh, we went to Memphis. And I had to relive, imagine this, all those places and all those moments. I went to the exact same spots, and I got deadly ill. Really? Oh yeah, for, I was three weeks, I thought I was gonna die. Oops. The nerves, I had to relive it. And um, then we went to St. Louis. All those places in school. The only place I was happy when I went back to my old high school. But everywhere else was just traumatized. And you have to, on camera, talk about, well, this is where the old shack was, and this is what happened here, and you know. <laughs> so, yeah, so it's. It's, it's real. Mm. But I go, who gets a chance to actually relive that, you know? 
So the documentary is going to take you to some strange places. When when is the documentary coming out? Um, I'm thinking possibly January, February. Right. So it's I uh, heard it's in post production. Right. And um, where can people find out about that? Is it on your website or something? Would it be my website and uh, tequilamockingbird.com. It should be there. Um, it just goes pretty deep. It's not about bodybuilding, even though I became one. People think this is about bodybuilding. It's not about, about bodybuilding. No. Yes, I became one. But it's about real life, hard, true life. And a lot of people are suffering. A lot of people are going through mm. that. And, and me, I can relate to the kids so much more. Because I see kids now, and I can look at that kid and go, he's in trouble. Or she's in trouble. You can see the pain. They can't hide it. Mm. So, final question then, Tony. Escape Your Limits is about escaping what you've believed is impossible and gone on to make possible. We've covered quite a few of those examples here, but is there a recent memorable one that we've not talked about where you've escaped your own personal limits? I don't know. It just, um, I survived, you know? And I'm trying to figure out how, <laughs> you know? I mean, who survives that? I mean, it's, you, I mean, you look back and go, really, I did? When I was writing this, I go, did that really happen? Was that me? You kind of separate yourself from it. Mm -hmm. You know, you know, I mean, when I was writing it, it was coming to me so fast. I'm not a writer, by no means. If you had told me five years ago you can write a book, I would laugh. Yeah, right, please. I have no idea how to structure a book to write a book. But I found out. I learned. And I was writing. I would write every morning. I was training for a show. had nobody fed. I had clients all day. I would write the first thing in the morning I would start writing and it was seriously it was coming to me so fast I couldn't get it down fast enough and I, and I stopped one day and go this is not me this came from somebody else because there's been very few moments where I had to sit and think what am I going to write now that's me <laughs> right so this is this is came from somewhere else <laughs> and then I said the people in this book were characters and they played their parts really well. Like my dad, like my aunt, like some other people that I know. Mm -hmm. They really played their character part well. You know what I mean? Yeah. You, couldn't, you couldn't make this up. You couldn't dream of this. I had people say, this is not real, can't be. Or I had people start to read it and they throw it. They go, I can't read that. So many people have said, I could not read it because it brings up my own stuff. Right, okay. I can relate to this. Oh, I can relate to that. Oh, that happened to me. Oh, I, I know this situation. And they stop reading it. They get half, no, I can't read it. I don't want to go there. I don't want to unlock that door. Mm. So it's so all tucked away. Mm. You know what I mean? Yes, yeah, tough book to read, I have to admit. But uh, an inspiring story, nevertheless, as well. I appreciate it. So, um, and I wrote it just to inspire, you know, people, just one person, you know, Muhammad Ali inspired me. Yeah. It took one person to make me want to go and do something athletic because I had no idea where I was going to go. I had no future ahead of me. I had nothing, nothing, nothing. And, you know, I was, I had all the odds against me, if you know what I mean. Mm. All strikes. <laughs> yeah. So... There was no, and, and what, what, the point I was going to make, going back to Tennessee and Memphis and St. Louis, I always questioned myself, did I do the right thing by going to California? Yes, I did. Going back, it's like, are you serious? There is nothing. There was, it was, it was an emptiness. I was like, oh man, did I ever do the right thing? It's funny, my life. For the last 40 some years, I questioned leaving because I left my sister. Right. And I left everything that I thought I knew to go to a place I don't know anyone and risking my life. You know, it, you know people do die in LA mm -hmm. and they would never hear from you again. My family was poor, they couldn't find me. I was sleeping, sleeping behind the church. There was, there was no address to find me. So. But I did the right thing. Yeah. So you gotta find, you gotta follow your instincts and your guts, and you gotta find your own passion. You know, bodybuilding became mine. It just, it just came to me, 
I didn't find it. Some people's music, some people's dance, you know, some people it's, it's gotta be sports. But you just gotta find what makes you happy and make sure you're in a good environment. That's important. Pick and choose your friends very carefully. Yeah, environment seem <clears throat> that you moved into seemed to kind of be a bit of a catalyst for a lot of, you know, compared to where you were from, was, you know, seemed to be a catalyst for a lot of other doors opening at a time, which yes, probably yeah. wouldn't have happened before. Oh, absolutely. Yes, yes. It, it helped a lot, yeah. I was fortunate. I was just, you know, I'm, I'm blessed. Yeah. I just got to look back and go, I, was, I read that sometime I sit down and start reading my own book. And I go, I guess I was blessed, because this can't be true. <laughs> it's funny how you block things out, though. You really do, and you protect yourself. You just, you know, the days when I was writing the nice stuff, winning titles, I was happy to go home to write. And the days of the bad days, I'm, I cry. Mm. And I have to go home and write. And you're writing, you're crying the whole time. Because you're reliving it. And then you start remembering other stuff that happened. Oh, yeah, that happened too. <laughs> yeah. Well, Tony, thank you so much. Appreciate you coming here. It's thank been you. A wonderful, thank you. Uh, yeah, wonderful to meet you at last. I and, really appreciate um, I wish it. you all the success in, in the future. And uh, looking forward to the next challenges that you take on for yourself. Thank you. <laughs> thank I you appreciate it. Appreciate thank it. you. Awesome. Hey, I hope you enjoyed this podcast. If you did, then please go over to iTunes and subscribe to the Escape Your Limits podcast. Leave a review, leave a comment. It really would help us a lot to continue to keep these going.